Hey there, my name is David Rogers, and I want to welcome you to the Nashville Jazz Workshop's Artist Spotlight, where every month I get the chance to sit down with a handful of artists with upcoming performances at the legendary Jazz Cave in Nashville, Tennessee. We get to dive into a bit of jazz history while also learning about each artist's process of preparing for their upcoming show. This week, I sat down with the incredible Kyla Jade, ahead of her vocal tribute show to the great women of jazz who have influenced her. We talked about how she came up in church with gospel music and the similarities in her experiences learning both gospel and jazz. We dove into the impact that Nina Simone has had on Kyla, and I also asked her about how this tribute show compares to others she's done recently. I hope you enjoy. Kyla, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you for having me, David. I am so excited for your show on I'm Friday. Excited. I'm, May I'm excited. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. We, were, we just finished rehearsing, <laughs> running through and going through all the songs, mm -hmm. hearing all this wonderful music just has me even more and more excited. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about how, how did all these women, Ella, Sarah, Nina, how did they all enter your life? When did you first come across jazz? Because uh, you do everything. You do everything <laughs> musically. And, and, and so jazz specifically, where did that come into your, your life? What's surprising is my jazz roots are almost as deep as my gospel roots. So do you remember Book It? Yeah. Back in the day? Yeah. So I was an avid reader. So uh -huh. I always collected all of these Book It coupons. Mm -hmm. And my school would do the fairs where you can go cash in your tickets. And so this particular time, there were a bunch of records. Okay. And so we didn't have a record player, but my grandmother had a record player. Okay. And I started just kind of crate diving as a young kid mm -hmm. in school. And I saw this plus size black lady. Uh-huh. And I just thought she was beautiful. And yeah. it was a Christmas record. And I'm a huge Christmas fan. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know who she was. I just saw someone who looked like my family. Yeah. And it was a Christmas record. And it ended up being Ella Fitzgerald's Christmas record. Wow. And I was obsessed mm -hmm. from then on mm -hmm. with her because her voice was an instrument. Yeah. And so after the Christmas record, the first song I heard was a tisket, a tasket. Yeah. And that was pretty much it for me. Like mm -hmm. once I heard Ella, it opens me up to a completely different demographic of music that mm -hmm. I wasn't introduced to as a gospel kid. Mm -hmm. And being a very strong alto back then, I wanted to find voices that matched mm -hmm. kind of my voice. Mm -hmm. And so the next one was Sarah Vaughn. Okay. And it kind of just went from there. Once I was open to jazz, I just wanted to study it. I actually auditioned for Berkeley with Someday My Prince Will Come. Yeah. But I had arranged it as a jazz song with just a piccolo bass. It was actually really, really cool. Cool. But that was my introduction to Okay. Jazz. So you grew up with gospel music. Absolutely. Front and church, center. Yep. Church girl. That's all we listened to in our house. How did your studying of jazz when you first came across Ella and Sarah, mm -hmm. what did that look like? Because in church, you grow up. You're there every mm -hmm. Sunday, mm -hmm. choir rehearsals. It's mm -hmm. kind of built into your life. Mm -hmm. Jazz may be less so. So what does yeah. that look like? It wasn't readily available as far as vocally, but mm -hmm. I was, I'm was i classically trained. And so okay. I was playing in orchestras wow. at that time. So it was an easy transition for me because the classical side of it and the gospel side, jazz is about interpretation and feel. Mm -hmm. And so as a gospel kid, you learn the song, mm -hmm. but then it's your testimony that allows you to mm -hmm. give the song back to the people in yeah. your way or how God has blessed you in yeah. that way. And jazz to me was the ultimate interpretation of just music. Mm -hmm. And so studying really became fun mm. because Ella never sang anything the same way. Right. And I just didn't understand how she was hearing things, <laughs> where those notes came from. Yeah. And so it was just repetitive for me. Okay. I would listen to her records over and over again until I can do that. Um, uh, Mr. Paganini. Yes. I can do every single scat she did because I played it until oh. I could do... Every single run, Mr. Paganini, please play it. Like, I was like, oh, my God. So I would just literally just time it mm. and over and over again. Mm. And that's kind of that's kind of the discipline of gospel. Repetitiveness, mm. repeating it helps you remember. Yeah. And the funny thing about jazz is that that same song, Mr. Paganini, she sang it 18,000 ways. 
And so I was like, huh, <laughs> I'm never going <laughs> to learn it. But that, that was the fun part. That's yeah. the fun. I totally relate to that. I, I think when you're a kid and you're just so infatuated with mm-hmm. the sound of something and you don't even realize what you're doing, but you're practicing and all you're transcribing all the and time. all the things that, you know, you're taught in school, mm-hmm. but it's almost like you're unconsciously doing that. And then you hear music everywhere. Yes. You hear it everywhere. You hear it in everything. People, I'm a huge Bugs Bunny fan. Mm. And my favorite season was June because they played all of the musicals. Uh-huh. So it's called June Bugs. Okay. And it, for a week straight, they would play every single cartoon in that time uh-huh. that was just music. And so you got Barbara and Seville. You got mm-hmm. all of the things. Like, and they would play them all the time. Yeah. And so having the classical playing in school, having the now the jazz association and gospel, you just begin to see music in everything. Mm. And you can start transcribing your life mm. because those cartoons had no words. Yeah. They were just actions supported by an orchestra. Yeah. So it just became a part of everything. That's beautiful. You are playing your first show at the National Jazz Workshop. I am. Yes. And we're so excited to have you. <laughs> You're fresh off a couple tribute shows, right? Aretha couple of big shows, uh, yeah. at City Winery and Elton John yes. at Third and Lindsley. Mm-hmm. How does this tribute show of sorts, I know it's not just one artist mm-hmm. on Friday, but when you're preparing, you're conceptualizing it, how mm-hmm. does the preparation or even the concept compare to the two other tribute shows that you've done recently? Well, every show has its own bag of stress and nerves. <laughs> <laughs> every every show has, has its own kind of life, I guess, is, mm. is what I could say. Mm. They all take a different kind of focus. Mm-hmm. The Aretha show, uh, that one almost took me out of here. So, you know, I don't even want to <laughs> go back there. It was She is such a bucket list artist for me. And so there was a lot of, I've got to do it justice. Yeah. And a beautiful thing I think about this show is that because I'm presenting women who inspire me, mm-hmm. I'm singing the songs that have been a part of my life for a long time. Sure. They all have core memories. Yeah. There's always something associated with the artist that caused something in my life to be beautiful. Mm. And so my preparation has just been kind of reverent because it's allowing me to, one, I'm, you know, I'm turning 40. Mm. I'm in a place musically where I've kind of, okay, this is who I am. This is who I present. I'm very confident in what I present, yes. what I give to people, what my story is. Mm. And so to add a group of women who were so significant in my upcoming, mm-hmm. upbringing, becoming phase yes. of life, um, it feels very reverent. It feels yes. I'm taking my time with it and I am being very, very open to how things move and feel. But there's a piece there, too. There's mm. a piece that I am standing on the shoulders of these women. Mm. They've all paved the way for me to do what I do. And I'm excited about it. Yeah. Talk to me about Nina Simone, because a second ago we were going through some of the songs. We we're doing a few of hers on mm-hmm. Friday. Mm-hmm. And you were saying oh, I just love her music so much, I'm going to have to do a Nina Simone tribute yeah, at yeah, some point. Have. Spoiler alert. You but, know, I say that, but yeah. I don't know those of you who are listening. Lettucey mm-hmm. did a Nina tour. Mm. And she came here to the Skirmahorn and she did Led Sings Lettucey. And I cried mm. the entire show, like to the point that she was like, stop crying, Kyla. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, it was so impactful. And because yeah. Nina is provocative. Yeah. She's provocative. She's in your face. She's unapologetically Correct. black. Yes. Here I am. Yes. The world is cruel. I'm going to sing about its injustice. I'm going to stand flat foot. You know, mm-hmm. as the young people say, she stood on business mm. from the very beginning. And to sing her music is to understand the struggle. Mm. It again aligns with gospel. Mm. Gospel music is the word of the Lord. Gospel music is the truth, is the story. Mm -hmm. And Nina wrote from that place. And so there are a few of her songs that are overwhelming even in rehearsal because you feel she did not write for anyone, really. Mm. She wrote because it needed to be told. Mm. She's an artist who sang if there was no audience, Mm. someone who wrote if no one was going to hear it. Mm -hmm. And... Again, when I say reverent, like mm. she is one that you don't just get up and half sing it. Yeah. So if I cry, yeah. y'all just <laughs> y'all just send some tissue <laughs> up to the front because I'm going to cry. Yeah. I remember the first time I saw that video. I'm, I'm sure it's basically a viral sensation of her singing. I wish I knew 
what it meant to be free. Phew. And uh, even just now in rehearsal, you can't help but feel something. Yeah. When, when you hear yeah. hear those lyrics paired with the melody, paired with the, the harmony, it's just, it's almost one of those perfect songs. Absolutely. And I'm looking forward to doing that one with you. I am We'll see as if well. we make it through. I, listen, <laughs> I will look at you. If you go down, I'm going down. <laughs> okay. Someone has to be strong. What is a moment that you are particularly looking forward to. We have a we have a great band with mm-hmm. the great Dorica Watson on drums, Brian Allen on bass, and of course the legend Rod Magaha on the trumpet. What is a, a moment on Friday that you as you're preparing, as you've been thinking about this, that you're really just looking forward to? I mean um, they they all everything we chose on this list, mm-hmm. there's there's something. Mm-hmm. Um, we were talking about in rehearsal, there's a song Be My Husband mm-hmm. and it's just Nina and Drums. And as a singer, you feel your best when you're supported. You feel your best when you're banned, which is why, you know, having you playing, I'm just fine. I'm perfectly <laughs> fine with you. But having a support system just gives you comfort. And sure. Be My Husband is stripped. Mm-hmm. There's nothing happening mm-hmm. but some stomps yep. and a hi-hat. Yep. And, <laughs> and the challenge of that song um, I'm excited about because it's not something I would normally do. Mm. When you see me, when you see videos, there's, you know, my MD, Jonathan, he's mm-hmm. usually there right on my tail yep. or my background singers or something is happening where I am fully supported. Yeah. And to do this one is going to be, I think, a, a moment for me. It's yeah. it's going to be something that I hope people enjoy. And then I hope they feel me. I hope mm. anytime I am blessed to perform and blessed to do what I do, I hope that people leave differently than they come. So it is my goal always to tell a story mm. that, not only means something to me, but hopefully means something to you. Mm -hmm. And if no one made you feel good or no one made you reminisce or if no one made you be reflective or be grateful Mm -hmm. that this night that we have on Friday, even though it's not a church night, it's not a gospel night, but music heals. Yes, Music heals, music changes lives. Yes, And that is ultimately our desire and goal. Ministry for me is healing. Mm. And so I don't have to be in a church to heal. I don't Mm. have to be, I don't have to be people over the head with God. I can heal because he has called me to be a light to people. And if my light can help you, change you, motivate you, hug you, Mm. hold you when you're crying, if it can do any of those things, then we have been as successful as we can be. Kyla, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I know I appreciate you. Thank you for asking me. Oh, my pleasure. And all of us, everybody who's on the bill, the people who've come before me, May is stacked. So many of my friends are playing. Oh, yes. And it's it's just, I'm grateful that the Nashville Jazz Workshop has allowed us to come Mm -hmm. and given us this platform. It's going to be good.